So a little bit later on in the year, now they have a deadline of March 1st when they're supposed to be done, and we're getting close to the end of January. Then they start, I get pretty much radio silence. They're trying to put things together. And then at the end, just creeping into the end of February, they show me the finished product, which they did a lot of edits to without consulting with me. That was just the communication, like they were trying to hide it from me. And it taught me at least something, why I stopped querying and why I am looking for or have been self-publishing. Because you have to know somebody else has skin in the game with you. They didn't have, they weren't invested. They weren't invested in it like I was. Now I hire that out and now somebody's got some skin in the game working with me because I'm paying. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 219 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Chris Rackner. Now, Chris Rackner has a PhD in physics and lives in southwestern Ontario, Canada. He's a fellow Canuck like me. He's been an astronomy teacher, physicist, motorcycle owner, competitive strongman, varsity rugby player, stay-at-home dad. He's a family man, data scientist, sci-fi nerd, professional, kilt-wearing, tree-thrower, Transformers toy collector, and sumo wrestling aficionado with plenty more stories to tell. And we do hear some really cool stories about the journey that Chris has taken through publishing. And that's coming up later in this episode. First, let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices has always been there for authors. Findaway Voices recently launched Marketplace. And that is a place where authors and narrators are going to be able to connect very much like ACX, but through Findaway, without all of the limitations of a platform like ACX. Because Findaway allows you to distribute your books into 43 plus retail and library markets. Now, the cool thing about Marketplace is it's a new program. And what I love about this is this is giving narrators yet another opportunity. And so, in celebration of the new Marketplace they're launching, they have launched on their blog, The Ultimate Guide to Marketplace Narrator Profiles. It's a six-part series. And what they're going to be covering to help narrators set up the proper platform so that the right authors can find them, they're basically going to talk about your custom URL your avatar, your header cover image, the background color, your author intro, the bio and badges, and of course the all-important samples. It's just one of the really cool things that Findaway does to bring authors and narrators together so they can collaborate for success. And if you want to see how you can be successful as an author and check out all of the options, all of the opportunities that they make available for you, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Just a quick personal update. I am recording this on Thursday, November 4th, 2021. And in a few hours, um, well, I'm going to sleep for a few hours. In a few hours, I'm going to go to bed and sleep for a few hours. Then I'm going to get up really early and I'm flying. It's my first trip to the U.S. I am going to be doing a two-hour keynote at the Liberty State Fiction Writers Conference in Clark, New Jersey. I'm flying into Newark tomorrow morning. Uh, Well, you'll be listening to this because this podcast is released on Friday, November 5th, 2021. I'll be flying into New Jersey, and then on Saturday I'm doing that. I'm ending the day of the conference, which is a real honor, doing a two-hour keynote on um, basically the opportunities available for writers. Basically, the, the theme is there has never been a better time. To be a writer, and and it's I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to meeting and hanging out with so many of the folks from uh, Liberty State Fiction Writers Group. 
And immediately after that conference ends, I'm going to get on a plane in Newark and I'm going to be flying to Vegas where I'm going to be at 20 books to 50K Vegas or 20 books Vegas. And I am doing some presentations there. I'm a panel about Apple books. I'm going to also be doing a presentation, killing it on Kobo and another presentation wide for the win, uh, as well as hanging out with some of the cool folks from draft to digital. So if you're listening to this and you're at 20 books um, or at the Liberty state fiction writers conference, please do say hi. Um, I uh, at 20 books, Dan Wood will also be there from draft to digital, but we're also bringing uh, a couple cool people from draft digital who have not come to an offerance con- author conference before. So Tara, who is the director of customer service, Tara Robinette is going to be there, which is going to be awesome to bring her there. And Jeff as well, who is the director of operations. And so it's going to be really, really cool to be hanging out with the three of them, uh, introducing them to uh, all as many of the authors as we get a chance to. Dan's a lot more social than I am, of course, so he, he knows more people than I do. But uh, yeah, that's going to be kind of fun. So if you're at 20 Books Vegas, do definitely say, hey, I heard you talking about this on your podcast. And because uh, normally when people approach me and they say, hey, I, I, I know you from a podcast and I go, yes, probably you've heard me as a guest on the creative pen, haven't you? <laughs> because that's usually where most people know my voice from. But it's going to be interesting. So I have I have a couple of interviews uh, in the in the queue uh, that I am going to be working on. And so I am going to be trying to produce this next week's podcast from the hotel room in Vegas where the audio is really, really crappy. So again, like this, it's probably going to be a relatively short, although it's not really a short personal update, is it? I am not going to go uh, with comments this week um, because I'm in a rush to I want to get this podcast out of the door so I can get my beauty sleep. But that's it for the introductory material. Why don't we get right into the interview with Chris Rackner? Hey, Chris, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Hi, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me. It is uh, really cool to chat with you. So I, before we get into your your journey in the last year or so and the things that you've learned, I want to go back to, uh, you know, who you are, what you write, how you got into writing, sort of that that sort of genesis story for, for, for Chris as a writer. Yeah, I mean, it's a logical place to start. We're going to go with the origin story. Yeah. I love a story that starts with an origin. Um, my name is Chris Rackner. I am a, a Canadian PhD physicist who's not working in physics anymore, but also likes to write. Um, I've been trying to write for years. I have a, a report card snapshot from when, in the first grade that tells me that I was huge in my uh, the publishing program that we were trying to make a book and I'd written a book about my dog we great still one. have that it's in my it's in my uh, drawer over there and I hold on to that so I remember that's when it starts in first grade six years old I wanted to be a writer ever since um, wow. uh, on the way up writing here and there I mean I've got some examples along the way um, in high school, uh, I got to this digital book craze, at least I posted on a blog. I had on a little website of my own, where I had a little serial of stories that will not see the light of day, but they were a little fun uh, pieces. So I had the, you know, two dozen readers at the time, and I think I made like seven or eight entries before I petered out. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Uh, I also published two st- short stories in, 2000, in the early 2000s. I think it was 2004 was the first one in a UK science fiction magazine called Jupiter SF. Okay. So if you cool. Google my name, that's Chris Rackner, R-A-C-K-N-O-R. There's hardly any of us. There's, there's no way to mistake me for anybody else. But if you look for that, there were two stories there. I mean, I only got paid copies, but I still have some copies. And I held on to that. And after that, I decided to, at least on the side, um, turn myself towards writing a novel. And again, that was 2004, and now we're in 2020, and that takes you, it tells you how long it takes to uh, complete some novels. Right? Okay. <laughs> There's a, a lot of work um, along the way. I mean, at, and during that time, I just I went to university. I, I started liking physics and astronomy, which my... A high school English teacher once asked me if I was going into science for the science or to make my science fiction more believable. I thought it was for the science. Now it might be the other way if we if this writing thing turn, uh, takes <laughs> off. 
Well, that's interesting. Yeah, because I think your short fiction that you had published was science fiction, but I know you have novels in a different genre, which we're going to get to. Uh, I'm curious about that transition. Well, transition, I mean, you can have more than one love. Science fiction, at least, is my right. in my first one, at least from a, a consumer point of view. I love me some Star Trek. Okay. I love me uh, most of anything. I mean, in the background, I, mean, I love me some science fiction things. Uh, but I also love mystery stories. I loved reading uh, Encyclopedia Brown as a kid. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and those sort of things. As a reader now, I like um, going back and... Uh, even some Robert Parker. Um, okay, all right, cool. John D. McDonald. Actually, I remember this is Lisa's little story with the John D. McDonald. My mother, I think she was concerned that I was reading nothing but comic books, uh, gave me the first John D. McDonald, The Deep Blue Goodbye. I mean, this is in grade school. I'm in the seventh grade. There I am with right. Deep Blue Goodbye, and I'm sitting on the uh, out there under a tree at recess reading that, and I get to the first racy scene, and I start looking around. Going like, what did my mother give me? <laughs> and I think it was a little bit of a hook, you know, just one of those, you know, somebody working through a mystery, asking questions. In the science, it's it's a different type of questions, asking questions and searching for answers. And in two directions, I have that. Uh, so I like it. I like it. I like both. Well, actually, you, when you when you think about it, uh, a scientist is an investigator, uh, is solving, uh, you know, a mystery in, in many ways or solving solving a problem or a question uh, confirming. So when <laughs> it, it's the middle of March uh, 2021, mm-hmm. as we're recording this and last year in 2020, March 2020, you had um, a publishing path. There was something happening. And, oh, my God, <laughs> something else happened to kind of prevent that. Can you share a little bit about what that, uh, what that journey has entailed? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it, it's a long journey. So at least this novel that I, I have published uh, then and now, and it's out there now, uh, began in 2010. Um, okay, wow. Little okay, so we're looking like 11 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So it began way back then. Uh, I had written a science fiction novel that I'm actually working on tidying up right now, uh, a new version of that novel. And my friend had read it and said, you know, this is, the characters are too good. There's a whole bunch of things wrong. And so I, I got an inspiration. Well, how about I make myself like a Peter Parker type of character, you know, somebody that can't catch a break or is down on their luck and they're trying to rebuild. And at the same time, anybody that's from Canada might know this, Little known science or not science fiction, uh, mystery television show called uh, Republic of Doyle. Familiar? Yeah. yeah. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> that premiered on television. All right. At the same time, I was in this just this phase of what else could I write other than this? PI show comes up that I absolutely love. I'm a physicist. These things, and I just put it together. So I'm holding on to that, building that for a long time. So that was writing and five years, six years, maybe, um, learning step by step because I, I was doing all my education in science. I didn't take anything in specifically in writing. Right. And I started querying publications. I got a lot of very nice rejections, some, some glowing rejections, you know? but you know, everything's like, it doesn't fit our marketing or we don't know how to market it. or It's just not right for us. <laughs> just as I was ready to give up, uh, I got a hit from a, a micro press associated with a university. They should not be named because uh, I'm not as happy with, with it. And that's, that's the story that's going to come with it. But, you know, they held on and it gave me that validation. Like, hey, not just people that already know me and don't want to tick me off, tell me that this is actually good or reject me at the same time, not just brushing me off. Somebody wanted to publish me. Right. And that was great. So I was enthusiastic. Uh, I got to go talk to a class of these are book publishing students. They're going to be the publishers of the future. Hopefully we talked about the story, talked about books. It got me revved up. They were working on it. I mean, it got me so revved up that I wrote the sequel to the book I have in five weeks. I mean, faster than I had before. I mean, wow. It was, draft, it was like I, five, I, five years to five weeks. Yeah, it was real fast. <laughs> I mean, the first, first draft, but it was a much better first draft than at least the first seven drafts of the, uh, the the first novel. 
And I, I was just so hyped. And then the actual process came down. Now, I don't want to throw the students under the bus because I have no idea exactly what they're going through, but they didn't necessarily turn in the best of jobs. I could tell because, I mean, of course, they give me editing to go to do along the way. And it was yeah. coming in rather slowly. There wasn't a lot of substantive edits coming back. I mean, we get some a word here, a comma there, not a whole lot going on. So I start to, you know, question. Then they give me the first, their first attempt at the blurb at the back. And it reads like they haven't even read the book. All right. So a little bit later on in the new year, now they have a deadline of March 1st when they're supposed to be done. And we're getting close to the end of January. Then they start, I get pretty much radio silence. They're trying to put things together. And then at the end, just creeping into the end of February, they show me the finished product, which they did a lot of edits to without consultants consulting with me. Uh, changes that, I mean, looking at them now, I mean, I eventually did make some of those changes or edits around those places. That was just the communication, like they were trying to hide it from me. They're like, oh, we don't know how yeah. he's going to react to us changing his work right? or wanting him to change his work in this right. way. The communication wasn't there. They also gave me some story about having lost a file and having to redo some of the work at the last minute where I know. Right. I mean, we were, we were all students one day. The stuff gets put off. I mean, I was excellent, excellent at um, studying the night before an exam or <laughs> getting that, uh, that assignment done right at the last minute and doing a, a pretty decent job. You thrive on that last minute you know, inspiration right. that comes in these pieces. And I guess it sort of uh, let them down. In fact, uh, the blurb piece, one of the pieces that got me the most, was the blurb that was going to be for the back of the printed edition. When they gave me that first blurb, uh, it was like they hadn't read it at all. So I gave them my version of the blurb. And they took theirs and mine and put together, and they had a, a half-decent blurb. I thought it was pretty good. So that was off to the side. But when I get the, here are the prints for, here's the print of what's going to be coming to me in the print version on the back, there was that first blurb that was terrible right there, and it was too late to do anything about it. Oh. And it taught me at least something, why I stopped querying and why I am looking toward or have been self-publishing. Because you have to know somebody else has skin in the game with you. Right. And these students, uh, apart from their mark, which was independent of my sales or the finished product, depending on what their teacher gave them, they didn't have, they weren't invested. Right. They weren't invested in it like I was. I mean, I've spent 10 years, 11 now, uh, 11 years on this book, on this series, which now I have, I have three of them. And they aren't in it like I am. Okay. To make it better even, the amount of time, I could have used a lot of back and forth right, to explain, to come along, because I'm stubborn. You're going to get some changes. First time working with an editor that's not you. Right? It's gonna, some right. things are going to take some time. But I mean, it wasn't there. It wasn't there, the process that I needed. So now I hire that out. And now somebody's got some skin in the game working right. with me because I'm paying. Them. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> so you had this book that was coming out uh, in March of 2020. Um, what happened? You had some plans, you had some things that were supposed to happen. Yes, we had a, a few plans. It was supposed to launch on March 1st, or at least it was the first Monday or something, but March 1st, it was supposed to go ahead. Right. That was delayed a week or so after I started to announce it to people like, Hey, it's coming out on March 1st. Now, wait, wait, wait. They told me, I mean, I know that's tomorrow, but now we have to wait a week. <laughs> then we had a, a launch party, which was, a little bit of something to be at the university. We we're going to go to meet some people, meet some students, sign some books, do a little reading. Okay. Mostly a little bit of a celebration, more for the students. Like, hey, we did it. Uh, they did something. But, hey, they did something. And that is when COVID swept into Canada. Uh, on the Friday uh, that my little party was going to happen, a little launch, uh, the Ontario government made an announcement. I don't remember exactly, but it was that we are going to go into a lockdown. Uh, March break, the kids weren't going to go back to school after March break. The next week, 
on the Tuesday, that's when the stay at home order and everyone started working from home around here. It was yeah. on that day that the announcements were laid like, hey, a pandemic, it's coming, it's global. We're, we have to do something about that. And then I was told the university, at least around where I was going to do, turned into a ghost town. Many of the students weren't even responding. Nobody was going to be there. So I had to cancel everything. We were going to do a little something in a reading in the university that had to do with a book fair that was going on around the, the same time. Uh, that, that was going to be a week or so later. That immediately got canceled and axed. And then just plans blew up. And then I saw the, the you know, the, the, the piece of work that went out onto Amazon. And uh, I really didn't like it. So I think it stayed up there for three days before I got the nerve to bring it down. And it is now, and I went back in the mean, and uh, all the rest is a journey through the year where I made a point of it. One year to the day, March 1st. 2021, one year when it was supposed to come out, it and two of, it, two of its sequels uh, have released Why? Wait, sorry, three books in the series. A year later, mm -hmm. three of them released under your control completely with your branding, your blurb, <laughs> rather than the, the, from someone who hasn't read it. Okay. And how did, how did that, how did you get to that? Like, so you got to the point where you thought, no, this is just not for me. And then what was your process after that? Like, uh, where did you go to learn what you needed to do to kind of take control of your own destiny? Uh, podcasts. That's why I'm so happy to be on one because I've been, I was listening to one for uh, some for a year. Um, you, the six figure authors, Joanna Penn, I was consuming a lot of them even before the whole process started. Right. Because this university press or this uh, micro press, I mean, I had a series in mind. Okay. And they would relinquish. I mean, I get control back of the book after it was made. By the end of the year, like they had no say into it or use of it whatsoever. So I was going to get control back. And doing one a year with this press, if they decide my one book is a year is what they want to do, even before. The, I saw the finished product, I realized, you know, I'm going to have to pick this up on my own. But when the launch fell apart, uh, I had to pick that up a lot faster than I anticipated. Right. So I went back to the drawing board. First, it was panic. I mean, there was a lot of panic at first. What am I going to do? And this was along the same time that we weren't sure whether or not I would be working or my, uh, my wife would be working. Uh, she was off for a little while. I stayed on, so we were okay financially. I went back to the drawing board. I had a first, I forget, it was a first, maybe I had a second draft of the sequel. And I had maybe three quarters of the third book in the series finished. So I decided to throw up the blinders and finish writing. So I wrote that, uh, those uh, two books, finished those, cleaned them up. Uh, subsequently, I actually finished another book and uh, this other this older science fiction one so i have two more sitting in the wings waiting for me uh, so i threw the blinders and just let's let's do some writing for a little while while the world is uncertain uh, <clears throat> i did look for editing i found an editor uh, we didn't mesh well at least in the communication phase for the first book I'm, any of her suggested changes i eventually came to it but it was more the communication it wasn't there. And then I hit on a, an editor that I really do like, and we really work well together. And I gave him all three books all at once. So we could talk about consistency between right. the books. And I gave him all three, and we're going to say, this is a big chunk. Let's go. Now, it, it helps that I don't write exceedingly long. These books are, um, the first one's 52K. Uh, the other two are just over 60K. I'm not writing real long. There's some epic fantasy people that my three books is maybe half of their one. <laughs> yeah. um, but having all three at once gave it a, you know, the branding on the outside with covers, but also let me brand on the inside a little bit better and smooth it all together. There's one yeah. story at least that stems my main character, uh, a little bit of my knowledge. Um, there's a journey of, a, of breaking his nose. Uh, fixing and going that goes through all three books and it ended up being a little bit inconsistent. And then uh, part of it was a key point to the third book. So I got to go back and make sure that it was smooth all the way through. That it was consistent right, right. 
that you aren't going like, where'd that come from? You, yeah. That was, that was, would have been good news to have back in the first book. So it, it made things really good okay. um, from that point of view. So let's uh, tell me about this. Uh, now I, we, we've kind of teased the fact that this was a mystery. So uh, what is this? Who is a, a, a central character? Is this um, is this Sean Ronan? Is that the, the, the detective or the investigator? Yeah, uh, Sean Ronan is my thinly veiled uh, version of myself. I, I turned into a, um, a detective. He's an ex-physicist disgraced um, by academic misconduct charges that he should be clear of, right? There's a conspiracy against him sort of a thing. Right. And I mean, it's a little bit of a stretch to go to mystery solving, but you know, I, I took the angle of asking questions. You got a person that's down about their life falling apart, grasping for ways to keep doing what they want to do. And that's asking questions and finding answers. And the first book is him being hired by the department that didn't help him nearly as much as they should have. Right. Help to investigate or clear to look into a pro another professor um, uh, accused of something similar to him, in a similar vein. And it's him revisiting his old path, giving the help to somebody that nobody gave to him. And then building from there, the, the fun and hilarity that ensues. I mean, I love the mysteries, especially locations, but I don't live or know anywhere that's cool like the Shetland Islands or, you know, Newfoundland, where they're like, oh, I wonder what culture is there. I'm just in the middle of anywhere, Ontario, Canada. It's just a, a university around any small city. So I've taken a snapshot, at least, of the world that I know, and that is the university and uh, academia about people and problems that go along in there that it's a little bit clouded over. I mean, everyone's seen... By now, the Big Bang Theory, that's been out for years. Yeah. And I know plenty of those people. I worked with plenty of those people. Those stereotypes are people that I know. Right? But many of their attributes are... Uh, and then there's more regular people with every sort of uh, predilection or personality under the sun. It's a range of people. But it's people with people, human motivations, and right. people problems. And it's all about, you know, money right? and your career and what other people think about you and what other people say about you and what you can do to help somebody else. Or what does it do to help me? And at least in the physics direction, when it comes to this is about professors, you have physicists that aren't known to be the most socially adept people and they do good research and they get hired to do research. Then they are turned into people that teach, <laughs> to mentor the next people that have come along. Most of them have no idea how to foster and mentor or even deal with like people under them. It's a research in the physics point of view or in science at all is like an apprenticeship. Right. You bring somebody along, you bring somebody under your wing. And some of these people have no idea how to do that. They're not the people that are best suited towards that. But the two jobs are put together. You got the research and you got, because the only people that know the research have to be the people to bring them up, to bring up the next generation, but they aren't right. right. So there's a lot of interpersonal conflict right, that, that, go, that can go along with people that are, like these are their careers, like their entire livelihood, everything they've been striving their lives towards that are in these situations with clashing with people that don't know how to necessarily resolve everything with right. people. So there's lots of stuff and a bunch of stuff that ha happened to me uh, comes up in these books. Like I had to switch professors because um, my master supervisor uh, out of the blue, well, he knew, he knew for a long while, but out of the blue, he told us, yeah, I'm leaving the country. I'm going back to Germany. And I was like, when uh, next month? Oh, what do we do? Figure it out. Uh, yeah. there's a storyline in my third book of I got a uh, in my postdoc after I got my PhD I had a um, a research contract come in from a company they it was supposed to be in July for me to start they were talking to me in June they're like we'll get right back to you with this contract the contract arrived in November and then 
the university and the hospital together were working on it, they promptly lost the money that was for me um, till April, right? Nobody knew where it went. Everyone that was working on it already had jobs and I was sitting on the outside like, where's my money? Luckily, I was teaching a little bit at the time. But there's all these little bits and pieces that experienced me like, you can make a mystery out of that. Yeah. You can have some conflict that comes out of this. Right. Like, how about I show this piece of the world to readers out there and see what they think? And the way that you did this is we took all three books. You've obviously worked on the branding, worked on the editing, worked on the cover. Um, and, and you just said like a year to the day, you made all three of them available. What was... What was the strategy involved in, in that? Uh, I'm making it up as I go along. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's my strategy. Um, I had an idea at least. I mean, I've been listening to a lot, but I have a failure or, or a strategy. Now we talk, I talk about this, at least it's a theme in especially the first book of my Sean Ronan is about learning through failure. Okay. And controlling your failure. You want to, you want to fail to learn. He who recovers from failure faster gets the chance to fail again. You keep failing, you keep learning. That's science. That's the scientific method. Right? It's not about necessarily getting the right answer. It's about failing and learning, failing and learning. Now, that becomes trouble in academia because no one wants to fund you to fail for a little while. They want to give you the money and they want you to give them the answers first. So it right. changes things around a little bit. But failure is how it works. And the fact that nobody gives you money for failure is at least a little problem in the system. But I'm taking that, and I, I have an idea. Uh, taking a, a rapid release model, but I'm starting from zero. So my first launch of, hey, I have a first book, is going is announced to crickets. That's about 50 people that of my friends and family that are probably aren't going to read my book that decided to click on my first Facebook page and go, okay, I'll give them a like. That's it. Right? There's not much going on. So no fanfare. Of that area. But with three books, I can immediately launch with the first one free. I can give it right out there. You take that, you know, you get the first taste for free model. Come on in. All right. And then I have the two to follow up immediately. It doesn't matter if you read it in a day or a week or a month. Uh, I'm not, I mean, it, it's going to be there. All right. Book one, two, and three. And then maybe, I mean, I'm working on four. Maybe by some time people come around or I'll be there. But I'm also doing it very slowly. I mean, I launch, I'm, I've got it posted on, uh, like a free on Kobo, I'm on one of their free mystery novel okay. pieces there, and that's actually doing really well for me. I used a small book deal website to get a first round, and I'm using uh, Voracious Readers Only to try and drum up some reviews. For putting it out there and as, as a taster. Here it is, free. Here are two more. So I'm not going to cut anybody off. They're going to read all the way through. But in that time, I'm still feeling it out. My blurb's right. Okay. Uh, I designed these covers and had somebody on uh, Fiverr um, make them look pretty. And I went, here's what I want. Here are the pictures. Put it together. All right. So is this right? Does it do a good enough job? Does it pull people in? Okay. Right. After they read the first book, do they move on to the second or third? What is sort of a read through do I get? I'm doing these piecemeal. And, but since I, again, I had no audience to begin with, I said I threw, I totally threw the idea of a hard or even a soft launch out the window. Launch didn't matter. Three books right. edited together to make it as cohesive as possible and put out there in pieces to see, hey, what works and what do we need to change? So you I mean, have, incrementally. just so I understand, you've got the first book permanently free and then there's a either a sample of the next book or a call to action to get book two once they finish that first free one? Is that? Well, it might be when something I, I update to change, at least the sample. Uh, but I, I feel like the first book's the sample. Um, the second book, yes, there's a call to action. The end, the end of the book says, hey, here's the next one, go get it. Okay. And then at the end of the, the second book, we said, hey, there's a third one. Go get it. And the, the, the end of the, the third book says, hey, there's a fourth one coming. Join this mailing list and you'll know when, when, it, when it comes out. I haven't written anything. Uh, people like those teasers to pull you in. 
to join a mailing list. I have nothing of that regard. Everything I've decided to write, I thought sat down to write. I'm like, I'll write this bonus scene or this bonus bit. After I started writing or thinking about it long enough, I go, you know what? That would go really good in this novel. <laughs> it's going to be in book four or book five. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they keep being put into like, right. Uh, uh, these things come up and they're like, oh, this will be nice and small, but they, they, they fit so much better as like a B plot in a, an A plot, right. B plot set up in another mouse. Well, maybe it, maybe it's a sneak peek at one of, the, one of those future books. This is a scene that's been readapted into a new book. <laughs> I, I do have an idea for that. Um, yeah. My, Fourth book has a flashback or a big section of the book. Uh, it flips back and forth between modern day and an origin, uh, in, in his first case um, in the summer before. And I thought about extracting the first case bit, just the first case. Oh, chapter, right. Okay. Putting those together and putting those out as a teaser when I move into the third book. But I have to finish book or fourth book. I have to finish book four first, and then we'll see if it works. <laughs> Excellent. So what's What's next for for you in this in this sort of process as you're as you're learning and and, and creating new things and developing the plan on the fly? I, we call it you jump out of the airplane and then build the plane on the way down or whatever. <laughs> we'll stitch we'll stitch together the parachute as we go. Yeah, right? uh, there's a lot of um, refreshing uh, Kobo rating life and uh, KDP and just seeing oh how many do I got today. How am I got to now? These are these are tiny numbers, right? We're we're looking in like the. It's a good day when we're hitting double digits, right? We're okay. we're at the, we're at the beginning of this. We're testing stuff out. We're waiting for those reviews to roll in, which we got two or three coming now, and they they're okay. nice and they're very nice. I like that. Awesome. Uh, and that's that's the feedback you sort of crave. The the thing I was looking for when I was querying uh, publishers, right? Just is somebody like this? Is it worth reading? I mean, I'm not going to be high literary work or something along those lines, but I mean, is it worth somebody's time and money? And those reviews are giving me a backup of that. And that's, that's great. So over time, that's where we go. I think the next stage is just more of the same. If we start to get, see some read through some actual people buying in the next week or two, maybe three weeks, uh, then I will put out to an even bigger list, pay for an even bigger list to put out right. people to go and we'll work our way up okay. and see if we can just keep getting more. It's the first taste free and then work on book four. Because when I launch book four, I'm going to take books one through three, put them into a, a collection. I'll put them together, put them at the same price as book two and three together. So they're combined price, but at least as one object, I think I might, be able to dip my toe in the water of um, paid advertising to that. Right? Okay. Then, then it's got a, a couple dollars of a, if you make this sale, it's a couple dollars back. It just as a, as a tester, little bits. Okay. All right, cool. We'll, we'll so, see where things grow. And then I have, I have other books. I mean, I told you about the fact that, I mean, I love my science fiction. So my follow-up series is a private detective on a space station. I'm trying to, I'm putting science fiction and mystery together. So I've got an idea and I won't reveal it quite yet, but it's, it's one of those things about mysteries. It's about a world that you know, right? And you try and figure out what's going on. And science fiction is a world that you don't know and you're trying to explore the world. How do you put a mystery? It's a world that you know, and you're figuring out pieces of it in a, a science fiction. And I think I figured it out a good way. Put cool. those together. And that's, <laughs> that's, where, that's where it's coming next. Awesome, awesome. So last question is, I'm going to go back to you because you have a time machine as, as, as any physicist, scientist, science fiction writer has. Uh, and you're going to go back to Chris, who 11 years ago or so, six, 11 years, was working on that Come first on. novel. When, when you're working on a first novel, what advice would you go back uh, and share with, with young Chris? Advice that I would share is... Trust yourself in the writing and don't get too hung up on some of the validations. Not every piece of writing is for everybody. Mine are not going to be everybody's cup of tea. You do good work on yours. Okay? You find a niche and you write to it. I mean, that, that's absolutely fine. I spent too many years trying to you know, write the be absolute best thing possible. 
and I only sort of stumbled into this iterative method where I try and then it doesn't work out in the failure and keep working on the next piece and, and learning from the failure. I only really stumbled onto that. I knew that from the beginning. I could have been doing that book to book instead of draft to draft. You write a book, you launch it, you see what people think. All right. So there would have been more feedback and would have been And I would have been to embrace this whole, you know, ebook phase or um, independent authorship a lot earlier because I was steadfast into the the vanity press uh, fear right from the right from the start right up until 2019 is when I started to realize that you know I I'm annoyed by waiting for people <laughs> you know having to query six months later you might get an email you might get one of those nice rejections uh, I had that with the querying short stories back in the day, it would take you forever. And it, was, it wasn't on my pace. Right. It was on my time frame. Putting other people in the driver's seat was not what I wanted. I mean, if I'm going to fail, we're going to do it at my pace. I'm going to drive us off the road into the tree. Okay, but at least I was in control. And right. then I can I can go. But if I just keep handing the keys off to other people and hoping they're going to drive me where I want to go. It's no, it's nowhere. It's no way to be not what I want. If I got onto that road a lot sooner, I, mean, I don't know if I would have made better writing, but I'd be, uh, I'd be deeper into it and I'd have more failures under my belt to have learned from by now. <laughs> Beautiful words of wisdom. Chris, uh, please let my listeners know where they can find out about you online. Uh, easy to find. It's Chris Racknor. That's uh, C H R I S R A C K N O R dot com, and then everything will branch out and link from there. Awesome, Chris. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Uh, thank you for talking to me. I hope to talk to you again sometime. I think the reflection's probably going to be obvious uh, about this, but but it's important and it bears repeating. All important things do is. Chris had a bad experience and, and worked on something and, and realized as he was getting to the book launch and all of these things that this was not going to work out. And he had the courage and he had the conviction and he had the strength to go back and try again. And very similar to a recent episode where uh, an author worked with a traditional publisher and, and invested in that. And Chris did the same sort of thing. And and I think it's important to remember that is he could have beat himself up. He could have just given up. He didn't. But he also did some research. He also did some work. And then he he stockpiled some books. He, he, he came up with a different strategy. He realized he was going to do it a different way. He was going to learn from the different people that he was listening to. He was going to adapt and reapply and do it again. And what I find so fascinating is... You know, look at how long it took to get that first book out. But then once he went in, made some mistakes and had some failures, he went back and learned from them and really went to town and produced far more after the fact. It was almost like you had to kind of cut your teeth first on this one project. And and you see that pattern a lot where it takes a really long time to get the first thing out the door. And then once you go through the process, and it's kind of reflective of some of the stuff Chris talked about what he would uh, recommend to uh, the younger Chris, to his younger self. And so that's one of the things I wanted to reflect on because you can make mistakes. You can go back. You can try things uh, again. And 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 you're not always going to reach success. There's going to be multiple failures. And it's it's how many times you end up picking yourself up when you discover those failures. And, and what do you learn from those mistakes that you made along the way? The other thing I wanted to reflect on is uh, also an apology to Chris. So I connected with Chris in March of 2021. It is November of 2021 as I'm recording this. I must have recorded the interview with Chris in the midst of a batch of recordings I had done and hadn't properly tracked that I had this recording ready to go. And I forgot about it, just like I had. Uh, there were actually two other uh, podcasts that came out this year that I completely forgot that I had 
recorded until the author reached out to me. And then Chris reached out to me just last week and said, hey, how's it going? Um, just wondering uh, what happened uh, to the interview. Um, because I know there are tech issues sometimes. Uh, there have been interviews I've done uh, where actually the author then reached out to me and said, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't want that to go live. Or there was a technical issue that we didn't realize and, and we may have to go and re-record it. So he's just reaching out to see you know, what, what happened, if there's something we needed to do. And, and, and and of course it was a, it was a dope moment for me where I realized, whoops, (laughs) that shows you how organized I am. Um, and so the lesson here isn't that Mark's a disorganized idiot. (laughs) The lesson here is Chris could have maybe taken it personally. He could have said, oh, uh, maybe he didn't like the interview. He's not going to run the interview, but he doesn't want to say anything. He's being nice or whatever. He could have done that. He could have been down on himself. I may never have found this interview or forgotten about it. Had he not reached out to me, I, I, I may not have found it. I may not have obviously remembered it. Had he not reached out to me, this episode wouldn't be live. Uh, and, and maybe he would forever be wondering uh, what happened. But again, in the same way that with with his book when he had he had an experience and he's like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna do something I'm gonna I'm gonna figure something out he reached out to me he communicated with me and asked uh, the question what's the worst thing that I could do come back and say no it was a horrible interview I hated it I'm not gonna play it right I mean that's potentially <laughs> one of the worst things that could happen um, well for, from an author's perspective is oh wow I thought I gave a really great interview but he reached out, right? Because really what's going to happen? I'm going to say, well, no, I'm probably not going to run that episode. You know, maybe there was some problem with the audio. Maybe we have to re-record it, which means more work, etc. But he reached out and he asked. And a lot of times we don't do that. We don't reach out and ask. So I want you to think about this. When you think about with something that's bothering you, something you're wondering, reach out, ask, request, go for it. Think about what's the worst that can happen. I was listening to this Sell More Book Show with Brian Cohen and uh, H. Claire Taylor. And and, and and Brian quoted Wayne Gretzky, the awesome Wayne Gretzky hockey player. And he said, you miss 100% of the shots that you do not take. And when Brian said that in the podcast, I went, woohoo, cheers, like, yay, that's right, damn it, let's go, Brian, go. Um, I, I know I'm going to see him at 20 Books in uh, Vegas next week, so I'll be able to high-five him, or, you know, if I if I don't touch people, high-five him in the air from a, a six feet away, uh, or two meters, as we say here in Canada. But, um, but yeah, you miss 100% of the shots you don't make. You don't get 100% of the things you don't request or you don't ask for. And that's the last thing I wanted to reflect on that I admired. And I'm very thankful that Chris reached out and said, hey, uh, whatever happened whatever happened to that episode thing, that interview that we did all those many months ago. So again, yeah, uh, think about that. Think about the things that you're just kind of sitting back on and maybe making assumptions and wondering about rather than just taking the time to give it a shot, taking the time to ask. Well, that's it for this episode of the podcast. Thank you so much, dear, awesome listener for listening to the podcast. I also want to say a huge thank you to my patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections, where for $1, $3 or $5 a month, you can get access to additional bonus content, including additional reflections on other podcasts. But thank you my patrons, and thank you, dear listener, for listening. If you're interested in supporting the podcast, you can always leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. An honest, honest review is all I'm asking for. Or, better yet, share this podcast with someone that you think would find value in these Stark Reflections. So, until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.